This, my friends, is the Mayan cichlid. Like reticulated pythons, iguanas, and the great northern retirees, this is an invasive species that's wreaking havoc in Florida. On the good side, from what I've heard, they're fun and easy to catch and really good to eat. What a cool looking little fish. Howdy boys and girls. Welcome back to the Raptor K Rustic Workshop. You know, after my baby Goliath grouper fishing lure video failed to quite make it to viral status, I wasn't going to do another fishing lure for a while, but I was watching this guy called Jetty Rocks Fishing the other day, and him and his daughter were out fishing in a ditch in Florida, and they are catching these Mayan cichlids, and it looked like a really fun thing to make a lure out of. So, oh, by the way, one thing about it, I will leave a, a, a link to, to the guy, Mike, that does that channel. You know, he seems like just a really nice guy. He fishes with his wife and his kid, and they just, it seems like a really good family. So, anyway, if you get a chance, go take a look at it. It's kind of odd. I, uh, the thing about it, I, I never really liked a lot of shows that people seem to be all into, like Friends or Seinfeld, because I never liked the characters. I always, like, still to this day, like to watch Andy Griffith or Last Man Standing, because I do like the characters. I guess it's the same way with uh, with the channels that I like to watch on YouTube. It's mostly people I like more than anything. One other thing before we get into this. In the last video I did, I mentioned that if I didn't get any comments on the format, I'd have to take it to mean that the format was okay, but you wanted to see me do the next video naked. The vast majority of you did not comment. And since I'm a man of the people, I'll go ahead and wait while you take your clothes off. Why anybody would want to be naked while watching me carve a fishing lure is beyond me. But so is the idea of men having babies. So, as they say in the original gender-inclusive pronoun part of the country, y'all do y'all. Found the pieces of wood I need in the scrap pile. I think they're exactly what I'm looking for. This piece of walnut is going to go across the top of the back and the top fin there. This darker piece of walnut will be the stripes. The orangish red stuff, which I think is paduke, obviously will be the red part. And then this piece of maple will be the bottom yellow part. Now, the maple looks awfully white now, but it'll yellow up a lot when I put in the clear coat. You'll see, trust me. I and mean, hey, look, you're the naked guy watching me make a fishing lure, so don't judge. As my buddy Rich says, safety third. And if you've ever tried to cut small chunks on a table saw, you've probably also caught a flying chunk in the chest, or worse. A holder downer like the one I'm making here works great to make a good cut and to protect your fingers and face. When you wear it out, throw it in the firewood pile and make a new one. You're welcome for that little tidbit. When you're going to join pieces of wood together, butt join them, it's really important that you're cutting square. So I was going to show this, then I thought, you know what, this isn't really important, I'm not going to include it. And then I realized that I'd been photobombed by my daughter's pony, and it was actually kind of funny, so I thought I'd leave it in. And now for a story that they probably wouldn't allow at the public library. Once a year, my dad took my brother Jim and me out of school for a week to go deer hunting with my friend Jeff and his dad. About a week before the trip, we would go to our teachers and tell them we were going to be out of town and why, and ask for permission to go and for homework. The rule was that if a teacher said no, we wouldn't get to go. None of them ever denied me, but I think Mrs. Craven, my fifth grade teacher at Emerson, might have considered it. Then she realized it meant I'd be gone for a whole glorious week, and she reluctantly gave her permission. It wasn't that I was a bad kid, it was just that if five kids were doing something, I'd be the one that got caught. It's a condition that served me well later in life because when the chance to say, I don't know, Rob Peaky's liquor store came up, I knew I'd be caught so I didn't even try it. 
Those unlucky kids that got away with stuff while I was getting caught would probably think they could rob a liquor store and get away with that too. Chances are they're all in prison today and I'm free as a bird. Most of the teachers said there's no homework, just bring me some sausage. Anyone who's hunted pre-wildlife management era West Texas whitetails will probably agree that there are only three edible cuts of meat on them. The tenderloin, the backstrap, and the sausage. And the backstrap was a little iffy. While the sides are still parallel, this is a good time to cut the slot for the lip and to cut the uh, angle cuts that are going to make the joint. My daughter set up her workshop right next to mine. I'm not sure what it is she's making, but it looks pretty serious and maybe you can pick up something from it. You'll find you can get a lot of the heavy material removal done with a scroll saw, in my case, or a band saw if you're lucky, and a belt sander or one of those combo sanders. It does a really clean job and it just takes a little feel and paying attention so you don't overdo it. Here's a little trick I figured out to help artistically challenge people like me make the gill details on the same on both sides. I put carbon paper face up under the printed fish picture and trace the gills and fins onto it. Then I flip the paper over, there's a mirror image outline on the other side of the gills and fins. So I can transfer it to the opposite face of the lure. You know a friend of mine once asked me if I take it as a compliment when people say that I'm smarter than I look. I just told him that if they put the word even before the smarter, we wouldn't have to discuss such a silly conundrum. Now back to the story. Those trips made up some of my fondest memories growing up. It was a week of bonding with my dad and camping out with my brother Jeff and his dad, who I called Uncle Walt. I've threatened Jeff that someday I'd tell stories of those trips, but I don't know. Somehow, in spite of his misspent youth, you see, I don't think he ever got caught doing anything, so who knows what he got away with then, or what he's still getting away with today. And I'm sure with the help of severely botched background check, he grew up to become an airline pilot. And for a real airline, too. Not like Spirit or something. He has to worry about his reputation. On the other hand, there's nobody to back up the tales like the Camp Pot Affair, or the that's my boy incident which involved partial nudity. And I'm sure the statute of limitations has expired so I may still do it. I may not though because he's likely to retaliate by spreading fake news stories about me and then I'd have to go to my safe space with my emotional support chinchilla. The important takeaway here is that if some guy named Jeff posts wild stories about me in the comments, don't believe a word of it. It's not that he makes stuff up, he's just getting old and he tends to misremember. Before the trip, we had a couple of rituals. One was to go to Gibson's Discount Center and get new boots, thermal underwear, and other necessities for the trip. The second was to go to the NRA gun range outside of town and sight in our rifles. Jeff's dad was an NRA member. My dad figured that if the government outlawed guns, the first place they'd go to take them away was NRA members. At the time, it seemed a bit paranoid, but the older I get, well, you see it today. Yesterday's conspiracy theories are today's reality, so the more logical it all seems. I mowed yards for an entire summer to buy my first hunting rifle from Gibson's when I was 14. It was a Remington 700 BDL, 270 Winchester with a four power weaver scope. When we bought it, my dad made a big deal in front of everybody at the store about how hard I'd worked and did I really want to spend my money on a hunting rifle. It was a little embarrassing, but I knew he was really bragging about me without bragging. My sons and I still hunt with that rifle, even though hunting for me today is really just hiking around with a gun. It still hits targets pretty well though. 
Now that the basic shape is done, I'll go ahead and put the uh, inlays for the stripes in. It's going to take a bit. The hardest part is getting the walls vertical so that you get a really good seal. The Dremel helps because some of the tools can help you get that straight up and down. But it's just a matter of patience and going back and forth till you get it right. When Jeff and I were 16, we got to go to the range on our own for the first time. Things were a lot different back then. I don't remember what a box of cartridges cost at the time, but we didn't waste a lot of shots. We took three shots, walked down to check the target, made an adjustment, took three shots. The cycle repeated until we had the scope adjusted back to where it was when we first got there. Then we took three more shots to check the grouping and then we're done. When we were about halfway finished, we were joined by some guys who came loaded for bear. They had spotting scopes, which I'd seen in outdoor magazines, but never in person. Their rifles were in wooden cases and their targets were life-size buck deer silhouettes. Nice bucks too. When they opened one of the cases, they took out my dream gun, a Weatherby Mark V. The stock was absolutely gorgeous. It was truly a work of art. I wasn't jealous of much of a kid, but I'm pretty sure that I violated at least one of the coveting commandments over that rifle. A couple of things I found that help with the inlays. One is kind of common sense, make it so that it's a little bit proud of the surface. It's a lot easier to clean the inlay flat to the surface of the lure than the lure to the surface of the inlay. The second little trick is to kind of, I guess you call bevel the inlay so that the part that goes into the cavity is smaller than the part that's out. That way it gives you a tighter fit and it fills in any little gaps or things that, that may show up. It makes a lot cleaner and prettier finished product. Jeff and I took our three shots and waited for them to take theirs. What followed sounded like a war zone or Chicago on the weekend. I have no idea how many rounds they fired, but it was a pile. What was interesting was that they may have spent freely on guns and ammo, but they were making up for it with what they saved on targets. Out of all their shots, one wayward bullet nicked the buck at the base of his tail and another clipped an unruly hair on his neck. Other than that, the target was pristine. Jeff and I looked at our targets with masking tape covered holes all over them and realized that we'd been doing it all wrong. Obviously, a true sportsman shoots near the deer, then scares it so that it jumps in front of the bullet. It made shooting at the actual deer seem kind of like cheating. Where's the challenge in that? I never mastered their method. But I have developed the ability to flinch when I jerk the trigger. If a buck ever jumps straight up in the air when I shoot, that sucker is mine. When you're doing the fin details, you'll find that the pelvic fins, the ones up on his breast, tend to break off. And that's it's just a fact of life. It's because of the direction of the grain. You're making a thin piece and it's at a point where the layers tend to want to break apart. So you might want to take a little bit of artistic license and make the fins fold back so there's more surface area supporting them and they don't stick out quite so far. That way they also don't get in the way of the front hooks. I think Jeff, on the other hand, had the method down instinctively from childhood. One day we were at the park near his house and Jeff threw a big caliche clod at a little storage shed I was standing next to, hoping to scare me. I was looking away, so he yelled, duck. I looked up to see the duck, and the clod hit me right square between the eyes. I didn't know if I'd been healed by a televangelist or hit by a truck. But when things came back into focus and I got up off my back, I was bleeding like a stuck pig. His mom was understandably pretty upset. And not just because, if I remember correctly, they had white carpet in their house. Of course, we being the junior Jacoby and Myers we were, placed the blame directly where it belonged, 
on the knucklehead that came up with the idea of yelling duck to tell someone that a dirt clod was heading their way. He's probably the reason the South lost the war of northern aggression. I can hear it now. I'll say, I'll say, duck, Beauregard, duck. Luckily, Jeff was able to convince her that it was only an accident and only a flesh wound, so I didn't get into any real trouble over that one. I'm glad because I loved going to his house. I'd have hated not getting invited back just because of a misunderstanding. Before we go on, my legal counsel, Skeeter P. Snively and Associates, LLC, and I think the LLC stands for Lack of Legal Competence, said I need to read this legal disclaimer. Any resemblance between my bad impression of a Confederate soldier and any cartoon character, either living or deemed too politically incorrect for modern TV, is purely coincidental. Furthermore, there is no historical evidence to suggest that Foghorn Leghorn ever actually fought for the Confederacy or that he originated the use of the word duck to let someone know that a dirt clod is heading their way. However, statistical probability suggests a fair to midland chance that at some point a Confederate soldier named Beauregard did, for a brief moment in time, wish that he wouldn't have looked up to see the duck. Well, one thing I gotta say, I am shocked, shocked I tell you, that I've gotten so many viewers complaining that it's not fair that I tease something so provocatively named as the Camp Pot Affair and didn't share the story. Like I said before, good taste, self-respect, and discretion say that I should keep it to myself. On the other hand, if I ever want to have as many subscribers as a girl that farts in a jar and sells it, ah, well, well, what to do, what to do. Well, a little more cleanup and most of the carving is finally done. Next we're going to drill the eye sockets so I can put in the, uh, the little holographic eyes. That's a quarter inch Forstner bit. Then the next thing to do is to complete the cuts and break apart the little lure at the, at the uh, joint. That's always a lot of fun. It's kind of that you've done a lot of work and you want to get this so that it breaks off, it cuts in the right place, and you just never know until you're done. It's still going to require a little bit of cleanup, but it came out pretty good. The lip is made out of plexiglass. When you install the thing, it you got a choice. If it's running more parallel to the direction of the lure, it will make it run deeper. If you run it perpendicular, pointing down, then it will add more action, but it won't dive as deep. For this one, I chose a kind of heavy on action and not so much on depth because it's not a very deep running lure. Because of the shape of the fish, it's going to take a lot of weight to make this thing float vertically like it's supposed to. So um, what I'm going to do is drill the length of the fish through the joint, and that way I can put a whole lot more weight in. Then I'm going to plug that hole with a little dowel that I'm going to make out of the same wood. What I'm doing here is making the little inlay for the spot that's on its tail. I wasn't going to do it because it didn't seem like it was going to add that much to the lure, but then I realized I had to. So, eh, add another step, but it's worth it. I've decided to go ahead and tell the story about the Camp Pot Affair because it was really important to my growing up. It kind of built me into the man I am today. Because it's the place where I first learned about something I call political truth which is the ability to say something that is absolutely factually accurate that at the same time absolutely misrepresents reality 
because that's what the listener wants to hear. So, we were on our annual deer hunt with Jeff and Uncle Walt. In the old days, there weren't bathrooms everywhere you may want to camp, especially on the ranch. And while most of us just grabbed a tree limb for support or hung our business ends off the end of an appropriate rock, some of the more advanced outdoorsmen made use of a thing called a camp pot. It was a pair of aluminum tubes, each formed into the shape of a rectangle. They were joined by a screw or other pin-type device in the middle of the long sides of each rectangle so that they could fold together for easy storage or open up to form the legs of a stool. A plastic toilet seat was permanently attached to one tube and had a channel cut in the other opposite side where it would engage and in effect lock itself around the other tube thus forming a structure that was capable of supporting a large person even after several days of eating deer camp food. Some of the higher end models also had clips that held plastic bags under the stool, I suppose for use in town, maybe like when you're at a parade or a ball game and a bathroom trip could cause you to miss something important. Advanced outdoorsmen are nothing if not considerate of those around them. So I put in what weight I thought I would need and then put a coat of clear on so that I could test it and see how this thing's going to function. As you can see, it's not going to stand up. So I added a little bit more weight, actually a good bit more weight. See what happens here. It's hard for you to see it. I put it back there. So it is staying upright. I throw it in, it goes upright. That's a good sign. And it's floating, barely, so it's, the lip isn't touching the bottom of the bowl. Our dads were, of course, advanced outdoorsmen. And while I don't know who owned the camp pot that we brought on that particular trip, I do know that Jeff and I soon found out that the plastic channel that was supposed to lock on the opposing tube was broken. Not all the way through so that it was noticeable when you assembled the stool, but only part way through so that if you shifted your weight during a power squeeze, it would slip off and the stool would collapse and you'd find yourself sitting on, well, another stool. One night, Jeff and I were in his tent, probably discussing the intricacies of last Sunday's sermon or working on next semester's homework, when his dad came in and asked where the camp pot was. Jeff, as politely as you please, said that it was next to the truck, but as the case with all political speech, he only told his dad what he wanted to hear. After all, nobody after a few days in a deer camp wants to hear that the camp pot is broken. That could ruin a person's whole day. We never could understand why his dad was so mad when he came back to the tent 15 minutes later. We would have asked, but Uncle Walt wasn't a politician and he probably would have told us stuff we didn't want to hear. Well, my neighbor's out of town, so uh, we get to go test the lure in his swimming pool. You can see it's pretty neutral buoyancy, and I like that. Look at that swimming action. It just, it's just so natural looking to me. It's really nice. I'm proud of this. So about does it for the Mayan cichlid. I'd say I'm pretty happy overall with it. Uh, a little downside is that the Paduk came up darker than I'd hoped it would after the clear cut went on, or clear coat went on. The uh, maple yellowed nicely. The walnut looks really good. The inlays came out nice. The, my daughter's pony was up close to the house and generously donated some tail hair to make a little bucktail, which I think adds to the lure. It looks pretty cool that way. The lip did a really good job. The weight I put in it worked well as far as making it pretty neutral buoyancy. The lip gave it a really nice swimming action. It goes about a foot deep, maybe a little deeper, but these are shallow water fish and that's what I wanted. So overall, I think the lure, this is one that probably could catch something. I'm really pleased with it. I uh, want to thank you for watching. I hope you got a kick out of something in here. And uh, oh, last thing, well it's almost the last thing, if you got a chance, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Uh, leave a comment, tell me what an idiot I am, I don't care, have a good time. 
But uh, last thing is if you're watching this at the public library, it's probably a good time to put your clothes back on. Um, don't ask me how I know this, but they will take your card away from you. So just saying. Y'all take care. We'll see you soon.